welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. I'm Glenn Fay, Director of Education here at the CIS. As many of you all know, CIS has long placed education policy and practice at the very top of our priorities. Among other reasons, that's because we recognise that high quality schooling is the best policy lever that we have for achieving economic prosperity, for individual fulfilment, social cohesion, and for a dynamic civil society. And that's why it gives me such a great pleasure to be able to welcome our special guest today. Now, it's not her first time with the CIS, but it's her first time here in person. Catherine Burble Singh is the principal and co-founder of Michaela Community School in Wembley, London. But before that, I'd like to introduce to you a teacher from here in Sydney who's delivering on many of those things that Michaela Catherine School does so well. Manisha Gazula is the principal of Marsden Road Public School. That's a large uh, public school in southwestern Sydney, which has around 700 students. And around uh, 90% of her student intake come from a non-English speaking background. Most, if not all, the students at the school would be considered to be socio-educationally disadvantaged. And yet, Manisha's school achieves well above their, their, her peers and well above state average. So I'd like to invite Manisha to deliver a few words here to kick us off today to discuss her, not her experience embracing the work of Catherine Burble Singh as a way of uh, us being able to then uh, hear from Catherine. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome Manisha Gazula. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, everyone, and welcome, everyone. Uh, first of all, what a pleasure and privilege it's going to be to hear from Catherine Beeble Singh herself as to how we can improve school in Australia, which, because we all know, as Glenn has stated the statistics, we it is it's it won't be a exaggeration to say that we are in a dire strait. Uh, to say that our year nine students are using punctuation at the level of year three is not something that can be said is acceptable in a country like Australia. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Catherine. And just a little bit about, uh, just uh, expansion on what my school is. Um, uh, Glenn has given a lot of details about my school. It is in Sydney Southwest. 90% uh, of our students for, come from a language background other than English. 65% of them who come to school have not uttered a word of English until they come to our school. So they have even been speaking for English for fewer than three years. 20% of our students come from a refugee background. So nearly 150 students have been either in uh, refugee camps in Syria or Jordan before they come to us. Uh, and 50% of our students come in the low socioeconomic bracket. So when we talk about my school in Liverpool, there's a perception. Oh, that this is a school where kids are going to be throwing chairs out of the windows and kids are running a mark and they're disrespectful. And uh, to be fair, uh, school three kilometers or four kilometers away from my school, some of those behaviors might be happening. I worked in a similar school for 11 years as a teacher and I've been threatened to have my throat slit and my car uh, knocked. But uh, I think that's not because the kids don't, uh, have, don't know what to do, but they don't know what to do, not because they don't want to, but because they haven't been or shown the right way. But when you visit Marston Road Public School, um, most often people will say, oh, wow, this school is so nice. It's so pleasant. It seems like the kids are behaving. And I say, no, it's not. It seems it is. And the kids are behaving and the kids are doing the right thing. And before I say anything more about my school, uh, let me begin by saying when I first heard about the Michaela Way. So I started in 2016 at Marston Road Public School. And I started as a relieving principal. And one of the, my top priority was to have a school-wide curriculum. Because as you know, the curriculum is interpreted the way people want to interpret because they think that's their art and their craft. And I'm thinking, no, it's a science, the way we do it. Uh, so, and the second thing we wanted was, we wanted to have a systematic and a research base, which is a pedagogical approach, which is explicit instruction model. So that was my priority, to have those two in place. And I had my exec meeting with my two instruction leaders and deputy principals in my office. And I was discussing about how we are going to plan and implement a core program across the school. Uh, and one of the things I said was, I also need systems and structures in place so that there is a good learning environment with good work ethics where the children can flourish with the explicit instruction model. And one of my instruction leaders who's in the audience right now, uh, he said to me, oh, you want the Michaela way at our school? And I said, what's that? And he said to me, I'm reading a book. It's called The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Teachers. And it's about a school in London. And they have a drill and they have a, um, what was the use word he used? They have a, um, a, what, 
a boot camp. That's why they have a boot camp and they teach the kids how to behave. And that was a seed that was sold in my head. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. But I said, but let's not call it a boot camp because I don't want to appear in a paper saying, oh, there's a principal in Sydney Southwest running a boot camp with five-year-olds. <laughs> so I said, I don't want to appear in the current affair. So let's think about something different. Let's call it a different thing. And let's put our head together. And we came up with a program called the Marston Way. And it's a civics and citizenship program. So pretty much what we thought was our school rules, we had three simple rules. Uh, be a safe learner, be a good learner, and be respectful. But then how do you teach this three? How does it really look in practice? How does it look to be respectful in the classroom, in the school, in the, at the canteen, on the playground, when you're addressing a teacher? So everything, each one of those things, we had to explicitly teach our children. Because somewhere, somehow, as a society, we have lost the concept that it's okay to teach children good manners. Because we believe that discipline is such a bad thing it's considered as a good thing in every other field except in school. In school, somehow when you are a disciplinarian, it seems it's like it has a bad connotation. Whereas if you're a sports coach, it's expecting the best from your, you know, your pupil and you expect them to do this, this, this in a certain manner, you're considered a great coach or, you know, a great uh, tutor. But when it comes to teaching at school, somehow you have to always consider the child's feelings. And uh, I'm thinking, the child does not get hurt because you're telling them what's the right thing to do. It's a ch they are children. They are five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids. They don't know what is expected of them. You can't teach them at 15 what you didn't teach them when they were five. So they come to us when they're primary school kids. If we don't teach them work ethics, if we don't teach them respect, if we don't teach them good manners, you can't expect them to just you know, conjure it up and figure it out when they're 20. And then you wonder why they don't have resilience. And I find the Michaela way completely resonates with us. And we find it the most successful way. And our kids, people have this perception that this must be some kind of a military school where the kids are walking in two lines and not smiling. But that is far from the truth. The truth is our kids are happier. They are flourishing. They are successful. They are unafraid because they know what is expected of them. They know what the teacher expects. The teacher knows what's expected of her or him. And the school just functions like how schools should, where there's respect and there's learning. And I think uh, probably what we'll hear more from Catherine is more about the Michaela way. And I can't wait to hear more about it and learn more from it. So thank you for inviting me today. And I look forward to this. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all here. And thank you for having me. You know, it's funny because I was listening to you and I was thinking, well, I think you've just explained the Michaela way. <laughs> and the other thing I was thinking was, what is it that makes you like this? You know, I was thinking, what makes Manisha like this? Because I wish I could find more of you, you know? It's, um, and the, the, the big difference, I think, between you and some others is that it makes you angry when you see children being let down. And it makes you so angry that you're willing to throw the rule book out and you're willing to do what you're willing to stand up against what everybody tells us to do. Because unfortunately, nowadays uh, in Australia, in Britain, in the, the whole of the Western world, in order to get things right with children, you have to go against the grain. That, that is unfortunately the situation we're in. And so it means that all of us, everyone in this room, has to be able to find enough courage to stand up against what everybody's telling you. And when I say everybody, I mean the teacher training colleges. I mean your friends. I mean, I remember I once ran in, I met this woman at a party and she said to me how she was going to leave London in a year's time because her eldest was 10 years old coming up towards secondary school. And so she and her husband and the children were going to leave because, um, because well, they, they had to get them into a decent school. And this, they were relatively well off. I said, well, you know, why don't you think about going to a private school? She said, oh, no, no, I couldn't do that. We'd lose all our friends. <laughs> you know, now, and that's what I mean about having the courage. You need all of us, 
even if you're not involved directly in education. We all need the courage to be able to stand up to everyone we speak to because that is what empowers people like us who are on the ground, knowing that there are families who want this, knowing that there are people in the media who will support us with this, knowing that the, the culture of our society is not one we're having to fight all the time. Because the problem is, is that people like Manisha are rare. When I say rare, I mean people who are willing to go against the grain when they're on their own and when they're going to be vilified by everyone. Most principals, most teachers just want normal lives. They want to be able to pay their mortgage. They want to have a car. They want to have a couple of kids. They want to have normal lives where they go in and they teach and they come back home. They don't want to take on the whole world. I spend all my time arguing with everybody. I'm arguing with them on Twitter. I'm arguing with them on the press, in the press. I'm a strange person, right? I'm strange that I'm willing to go out and fight every day. Most people don't want to do that. Now, our fight began in, well, it was 2011. In fact, I came here to Australia in 2011 and I rang some warning bells at the time and I went to visit some schools. I mean, I went to visit schools that... You know, one school that I suppose was really quite shocking in many ways. I remember there were a lot of Aboriginal children in the school. Mainly it was Aboriginal kids. And um, they were doing a lot of, they were playing the guitar. You know, the teachers were playing the guitar and they were doing a lot of singing. And I was there for a while and I was saying, so are we going to hear, see some maths? Are we going to see some English? And the teachers more or less said to me, well, you know, these kids aren't going to really amount to much. You know, let's have fun while we can. Let's sing some songs and let them enjoy life. And uh, we were just uh, in, in, is it Tom? Is it your office? Yes, Tom. <laughs> it's in Tom's office just there. And we were talking about an article that was written about me where I'd been quoted saying that people think that I'm mean. And I'm mean because I'm the strictest headmistress in Britain and I have rules and I have detentions and things like this. And what I think is really mean is allowing a child off all the time, never giving him a detention. Doesn't matter if you haven't done your homework. Doesn't matter if you can't sit on a chair. After all, you come from a poor background, so I'm going to forgive you this, and I'm going to let you go through school, and I'm going to sing some songs with you rather than push through with the maths and the English. And then when you leave, you're going to be functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate for the rest of your life. That's what's mean, right? That is mean. And they call it compassion in the moment. They say it's compassionate when they say, oh, but it's all right. It's not your fault. You don't have a desk at home. Your little brothers and sisters interrupt you all the time. And it's hard for you to do your homework, so I'm not going to hold you to account on this. Well, you can do that, but you are assuring that child of failure for his entire life. And that's the thing that we need people to understand, ultimately, that being compassionate with a child, caring and loving a child, means holding the line. So I came here in 2011, and I rang the alarm bells, and I said, look, you guys aren't as far along the progressive line as we have gone in Britain. I can tell you what it looks like. We've been there. Don't do it, is what I said. Don't go down that progressive route because you're going to end up failing your kids and your country is going to blow up. Unfortunately, people didn't necessarily listen to me and you have gone down that road and now it's the case that you're 70th out of 77 countries for uh, behavior, uh, climate in your classrooms. As Glenn was talking about with those statistics, how Australia has plummeted in the last 20 years. And of course, the children who most suffer because of this are the most disadvantaged. They're the ones that come from minority backgrounds, come from poorer backgrounds and so on. And the reason why they suffer the most is because they are entirely dependent on their school to be able to make that difference for them. So if you come from a more well-off family, the family can make up that difference. The family takes you to museums on the weekend. They have dinners around the dinner table and talk about the politics of the day. They take you away on holiday to various places. And your parents, who's a professor and a doctor, 
You have conversations and they are teaching you all the time. But the child that comes from a poorer family, they don't have that. They are dependent entirely on their school and on their teachers. And if their teachers, through what they believe to be compassion, are constantly letting that child down by not holding them to account, that child has nowhere to go. And in the end, they end up in prison, they end up on welfare, they end up in some dead end job. And then we say, well, they were poor. What else could they do? But it's not true. <laughs> it's us who have failed them. We in the education sector have failed them because in the moment we feel so uncomfortable about doing the right thing. You know, I think it's really interesting, Manisha. I was watching you and I think I was thinking, isn't it funny that you and I are the same skin color? Because you know what? We're not white. We don't carry the guilt that white people carry all the time for feeling so uncomfortable about their privilege that they can't possibly hold a brown child to account. They won't put a brown child in detention because, well, I'm rich or I'm white and I feel uncomfortable, so I can't do this. But who loses out in the end? The brown poor child who is not held to account. The brown poor child who ends up functionally illiterate, functionally enumerate, and then spends his whole life trying to catch up and he he can't do it. We need somehow to be able to see beyond the guilt that, look, I get it. I get that the guilt is forced on us. It's forced on us all the time. And I always think to myself, gosh, you know, I'm so, uh, how difficult must it be to be a, 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 a white rich person? How difficult must it be? I promise you. I, 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 I feel for you. I feel for you. I feel for you in this climate. Because on the one hand, they're making you feel bad. And then what do you do? You then say, okay, okay, don't have the detention. Okay, okay. I feel awkward about who I am, so do whatever you like. And then you got people like me coming along saying, no, that's really what is, is harmful to the child. That's actually what's racist in that moment because you are letting certain children down because you feel guilty about your own privilege. And that is what we all need to be able to see beyond. Now, in 2011, I came here and said all that. It was at the same time that we I had the idea about Michaela and we started setting it up. And the fight in Britain was was massive at that time. It's much easier now to set up a free school. A free school is a school that's a normal public school in terms of how it's funded and so on, but, you know, and in terms of the admissions process, but it, you can set it up yourself and you can apply through the Department for Education in order to set up your school. It took us three and a half years to open our school because there was such a fight. And when I say such a fight, we would, we would have uh, events like this where families would be invited. I would go along in Brixton Market hanging out, handing out flyers about our school and mums would say, this is such a brilliant option. I'm coming along to find out. And all of these ethnic minority mums would be sitting in the audience like this, listening to me speak about this possible new school. And they would bus people in from outside of London into, so they would sit amongst the parents so that when I would get up and speak about the possibilities of a new school with all these mums who were desperate to have a new school, um, and, and when I say, when you want to talk about ethnic, you know, where the, the mums were ethnic, the people being busted in were white from outside of London, would sit amongst the crowd, and then they would stand up and shout at me in order to drown out, not just me, but what me and my, my, my group were saying in order to set up the school. We had to move to three different areas eventually in London to eventually open up in Wembley, but we started in South London and we were chased from place to place until eventually, by really some kind of miracle, we made managed to open our school in 2014. We opened with 120 children. We have been growing ever since. We've now got a full school. We've now, a couple of years, every year, we send a few off to Cambridge and to Oxford. But it's not just that. We've also got other kids who might become plumbers and hairdressers and so on. But they turn up on time. They know how to stand up and how to sit up straight. They know how to bring their equipment. They know how to say good morning and good afternoon, sir and miss, as they walk down the corridors. They are happy. And this is the point. You are happy when you are successful. You are happy when you know what, what, what who you are and what you can deliver. Um, just recently, in the last few days, we... Uh, progress 8 scores came out in Britain for schools and the progress 8 score is essentially how much progress have you made from when you joined at the end of primary to when you leave at the end of secondary school and so these are secondary schools that are that are analyzed in this way and we got this year the top progress 8 score in the country which <laughs> 
Thank you. <laughs> which, which was great to see. It was great, it was great to see and great to know just how much of a difference. So to give you a sense, we've got this Progress 8 score of 2.27, which means that on average, kids that go to our school end up with two grades higher, more than two grades higher than they would have done had they been to another school. Now, that on the one hand, you think, wow, and people then, the detractors say, it's not about results, you know, results don't matter. And you know what? I would agree with them to a certain extent. I mean, Results aren't the only thing that matter, but they do matter. We need to remember that. However, the thing I am most proud with our school is the children, who they are. And that's what you were talking about, who they are. They're polite. They're decent people. They have traditional values. When I say traditional, they believe in personal responsibility. They believe in having a duty towards others. We've taught them to be grateful. And one of the reasons we were talking earlier earlier about how one of the reasons why families love us is that suddenly they're, the, the kids at home are thanking their mums for making them dinner, you know? And the parents think, well, this is quite nice, actually. My, 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 my child suddenly understands all that I do for him. We teach them these values. We teach them gratitude because when you are grateful, no matter how little you have, you are a, a, a happier and better, I would say, better person. And so traditional values, we have traditional discipline. And when I say traditional discipline, I mean we expect children to be polite. We expect them to go the extra mile to help someone else out. In, in the canteen, in, in ordinary schools in the inner city in London, and we are in the inner city with a very normal inner city intake. If in the canteen, a child drops a plate in a normal inner city school, they drop the plate, what happens in a normal canteen is that all the kids start shouting and banging on the table and going, Vah! that is the kind of thing they do. Our kids, somebody drops a plate, five or six of them run to help them pick it up and pick up the food that's dropped on the floor. Though that is the kind of, the, the kind of people that I want our children to be. So traditional values and then traditional behavior and discipline. And then, as you spoke about, Manisha, explicit teaching. And this, we spoke about at Research Ed yesterday. I spoke to the teachers there trying to give advice about how to make explicit teaching work. 20, 20, 30 years ago, it was normal. It was normal for every teacher to just teach from the front. As you're looking at me now, right? Imagine you're looking at me now and you're listening to what I'm saying. It's much easier to do that if you're looking at me. But in most classrooms these days, you wouldn't be looking at me. You would be facing each other. Right? Imagine if I was giving this lecture and instead of looking at me, you were looking at those books and you were looking at the mirrors by the, the windows back there. I mean, it's a bit weird looking in that direction and yet I'm standing over here. But that is the, this is the reality of our classrooms, that special needs children are looking at the back of the wall when the teacher's at the front. And the reason that's happening is because the teacher isn't leading the learning. Right? The teacher has been taught by the teacher training agencies that they shouldn't lead the learning. The, 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 the teacher feels guilty. What I was explaining yesterday is that we have been taught that teaching is cheating. That's what we think. So we genuinely, teachers think, oh no, I mustn't tell them because that's somehow to give them the answer. So I just have to w talk in this way that's slightly mysterious and try and draw it out of them because somehow it's going to be in them. How are they meant to know that this is a triangle and this is a square unless you tell them? You have to tell them. And once you've told them, you can then ask them a little bit later, tell me. Which one's the triangle? Which one's the square? If you have never told them, they can't possibly know it. And yet, I say that, that seems obvious. I promise you, in the education sector nowadays, it is not obvious. We are all taught that somehow this information is inside them and that we need to draw it out. And as I was saying yesterday, the story I always tell is when little Amy is sat at the front and you're asking a question, that you ask a question and you haven't told them the answer. You haven't taught them this. You're imagining you're drawing it out of the child. And every time you ask an answer, little Amy goes, me, 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 You know why? Because when she goes home in the evenings, she sits around with her parents and talks about the politics of the day and reads the books in her father's mother's bedroom. And she has a lovely time 
going to museums and to art galleries and so on. So every time you ask a question, little Amy knows the answer. Little Johnny at the back of the classroom has no idea. And he thinks to himself, gosh, how come Amy always knows the answer? I must be really dumb. Because what Johnny doesn't think in that moment is, I must be from a different socioeconomic background. <laughs> he doesn't think that. What he thinks is I'm dumb. And then he misbehaves and he keeps on misbehaving over and over again because his self-esteem takes a hit every time the teacher asks a question he doesn't know the answer to. And then eventually he gets sent out of class and then he gets a special needs a stamp on him which ruins him forever. And when he leaves school functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate for the rest of his life, we say it was because he was poor, but it isn't because he was poor. It was because we never taught him properly. All we need to do is have traditional values, traditional discipline, and traditional teaching. I say that's all we need to do. The problem is that this is so simple, and yet it is impossible to make happen. It's a fascinating situation where something so very simple that 50 years ago we all took for granted and yet now it's a fight and it cannot just be our fight it can't be it has to be all of our fight because you and I will lose if it's just us we need all of you and all of us need to understand your country Australia lies in the palm of your hands right now and you can turn this around you can but it requires all of us to make that effort. It requires all of us to believe that you can change your country. The children really are the future. Now, I never understood why people don't take education more seriously. Children are the future to any country. And if you care about Australia, if you love Australia, you need to be courageous enough to stand up and be counted. Because if you're here today, it's because you want to hear this stuff. You want to hear this the truth and to refer to what you were talking about the truth you know Thomas Sowell a great uh, you know hero of mine he African-American uh, social theorist and economist he has a quote that I always love to, to quote on my wall which says if you want to help someone you tell them the truth if you want to help yourself you tell them what they want to hear I've come here to Australia in order to tell you the truth however uncomfortable it makes us feel but the fact is the old adage is free is true only the truth will set us free so thank you very much for having me <laughs> thank you Catherine I, I did mention that your timing was was opportune arriving in Australia because literally as you were arriving by plane the GCSE progress results came yes. out Mm -hmm. um, which, which as, you, as you said, does reveal Michaela to be, in effect, the highest performing school in the country. But there will be some detractors who will still remain unconvinced. Mm -hmm. This is just one data point. Or that might, you might be getting good results in this area, but what about insert other miscellaneous item here? Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that kind of criticism or critique? Um, well, I have to say we're getting to the point now where um, the detractors tend to be extreme. You know, they're, they're the extremists. Um, most people understand what we're doing and like what we're doing. Uh, there are lots of people in uh, education, you know, teachers, but also just policymakers and so on, who are very positive about what we're doing. Um, the people who say, what about this? What about that? I mean, I'm happy to answer them, always happy to answer whatever anybody's asking. Um, you know, people will say, I saw recently they were saying things like, yeah, but you don't have this subject or you don't have that subject. Well, fine, then in your school have that subject. I mean, I, I, I don't mind. I mean, the, the, the principles still stay the same. I mean, you don't have to do exactly what we do. You, you, you will change things according to whatever context you have. But the principles of excellent discipline, traditional values, and explicit teaching, that goes without saying. And what I keep saying to people is that, yeah, we've got the best progress eight and all of that, but in a way that's almost irrelevant. What's relevant is which schools are doing a great job. Take a look at all of them. What do they have in common, right? 
They all have this stuff in common. I'm listening to you and thinking I can just listen to myself. I mean, everything you were saying, I was just going, yeah, 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 yeah. It's all just, it's all obvious to us. It's obvious. And it's obvious to any principal and any teacher who runs their classroom or their school in that fashion. They see the difference. So Michaela was named after um, an old colleague of mine called Michaela. She was from St. Lucia. She was very old school, believed in rigor and in tradition. And sadly, she died of cancer in 2011 and we saw it fit to name the school after her. Her classroom was just like your school. Like the fact is I go around the world (laughs) finding people and they're rare to find, but finding people who are doing this in their classrooms, doing this in their schools. And They have the same story to tell, which is that the kids are happy, they're learning loads. There's a bunch of schools, there's a few schools in Amsterdam actually that have taken the name of Michaela and two of my ex-members of staff are there in in Amsterdam helping this organization spread Michaela schools in, in the Netherlands. And I went there and I went to visit the schools and the principals would say to me, A year ago, we were in total chaos. Kids were jumping out the window. Kids were horrible to each other and to the staff. And now look at the, look at how they're working. Look at how calm it is. Look at how happy the children are. All because we've taken these principles and we've applied them to our context. So the thing is, is that when they're, when they're arguing over details, these are details. The fact is that the main principles here can be applied to any situation and can improve your school. I've had, we have 600 visitors a year. I've had uh, head teachers from the top private schools in England who come, and deputy heads as well, and they look and they, they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed because our kids are more polite than their kids. They always say to me, Gosh, Catherine, you've really given me food for thought. Uh, they, they, all, they kind of sit down and go, wow, your kids are so great. And then they tend to say something along the lines of, but the thing is, I mean, if, if I did this in my school, the parents would be protesting outside with banners and saying that the head needs to be fired. And to a certain extent, they're right. And this is what I mean about we can't do it on our own because most heads are not going to stand up to the population. And if society is too busy, if parents are trying to be friends with their kids instead of trying to inspire admiration and respect, if parents don't understand that they need to be leading their children as opposed to to letting their children lead, then the school is having to fight that. And there are few people who are going to have the energy or the resolve to do that. So it, it, that, that is why all of you are so important in terms of who, all your friends and your families and so on, which is to spread the word. Because uh, it is also the case that too many of us are terrified, you know, and I get it. We're, we're terrified. We're terrified of being canceled. We're terrified of, of being hated by our friends. We're, but we have to, we have to find, and that's why it's so good to have organizations like yours where you can bring people together. So, you know, there are others who are like you, so you can feel some strength in numbers, you know, because we have to fight this. Otherwise it's the end of the West. Like that, that is where we're at. Right? Otherwise, it's the end of the West. So we've got to fight for the West because the West has a history of civilization. We all know this. And our kids don't. And you know why? Because nobody's teaching them any history. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to I uh, remain on this issue about detractors for, for a little bit more. Right, right. That, that, you know, they may well say, okay, we've well, got these academic results and so on. But surely they've, they've, you've stifled the creativity out of them because you've, you've given them this, this structure and order. How will they explore their, their boundaries? However, I had the privilege yesterday of, of observing artwork from students from Michaela that you were able to share at, at, our, at our research aid conference. How do you tackle this problem? Because evidently there's students who are just as creative or more creative perhaps than kids that go to other schools that purport to to deliver creative thinkers and the like. Yes. Well, and I would say that the only way a child can be creative is when they are in a safe and secure environment. So uh, the kids who end up being creative in more chaotic environments are simply exceptional. (laughs) And they manage to overcome the uh, restriction of chaos. So 
safety is not restrictive. Security is not restrictive. It's when you are in a predictable environment, which you understand and know that you are loved and looked after, it is then that you are able to push the boat out. You cannot be creative about something you know nothing about. You just can't. How can you be creative with it? What I, I use myself, for instance. If you asked me to be creative with cars, right? So Elon Musk is really creative with cars. If you ask me to be creative with cars, I can't be creative with cars. I don't know anything about cars. So I can't, I can't be creative because I don't know anything. Ask me to be creative with education, however, I can be very creative because I know education inside out. So I can push the boat out. I can think outside the box on it. I can do everything differently in education because I know it inside out. You can only be creative and think in an independent manner about something if you know loads about it. And in order to know loads about it, you need to have a safe and secure environment where you feel happy to put your hand up to answer a question and you know you're not going to get bullied for it where you are able to ask questions and engage with your teacher and the teacher is able to teach I think a lot of people have no idea just how poor behavior can be in our schools where children are constantly disrupting where the teacher might take 10 to 15 minutes to get silence at the beginning of a lesson if you, if you have a 45 minute lesson and you're taking 10 to 15 minutes just to silence them down and then you start off with something and every time you try and teach them something, they're, they're laughing uncontrollably, they're laughing at the teacher, they're insulting each other, a fight breaks out. How is anybody meant to learn in this kind of environment? It's madness, this idea that somehow this makes kids creative. One of the things that people criticize me for are our silent corridors because the children walk in silence quickly to their lessons. It means they have a transition of about a minute and a half to two minutes. They get quickly into their lessons. When you're trying to catch up children who are 11 years old, but actually have a reading age of a six-year-old, uh, you want as much time in the lessons as possible. If you don't have silent corridors, kids will take ages getting to their lessons. They might show up 10 minutes late. You finally get them quiet. And then suddenly a child comes bursting in, the door bangs open, I've arrived. Everybody starts laughing, Rah! starts going on. How is the teacher meant to cope with this? How are the poor children who are disadvantaged in that class meant to learn how to read? It just won't happen. And yet they are arguing that somehow my silent corridors are oppressing children because the reality is, as they imagine it, that if we didn't have silent corridors, the children would be skipping along the corridors, chatting about Aristotle. Well, I can tell you, I have never seen a child talking about Aristotle in their chaotic corridors. In fact, they're punching each other's heads into the wall. It, and the problem is, is that too many people are not honest about what is actually happening in our schools. If you are honest, then you do what's needed to make sure your children succeed. I have a meeting with my senior team every morning at 7 a.m., every single morning at 7 a.m. I do not arrive at school at 6.45 every morning because I hate children. I do it because I love them. I don't take on the world of the press and the world of Twitter and fight with the whole world because I hate children. I do it because I love them. I don't come all the way to Australia to come and talk to all of you because I hate children. I do it because I love them and I love Australian children too. And I want Australian children to have just as much of a chance as the kids at your school and at mine. I want them all to have it. And I feel for those teachers, I really do, I feel for those teachers who are in their classrooms battling it out day in, day out, wanting somebody. So I get a lot of correspondence from teachers from around the world who say to me, thank goodness for making me realize I'm not mad. Thank you for speaking out because I know that I'm not the only one who thinks like this. And that's why organizations like this here bringing you all together. It's so important for us to know that we are not alone and we are stronger in numbers and we must stand up to the tyranny of this madness that has taken over all of our countries over the last 20 years. But specifically, I'd say the last 10 years and even the last five years, the things have moved at an accelerated rate and we really need to pull that back. Let me put one of the, a, a critique that you've probably heard a million times. 
I don't like the way she thinks, but I quite like her results. Is it possible that maybe they've got that equation the wrong way around? That maybe there's something about your way of thinking that's <laughs> responsible for those results? Yeah, exactly. And this is what I try and explain to them. The thing is, I mean, and, 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 and I have a lot of respect for those people who say that because they've come halfway. Because there's a lot of people who just reject everything and don't aren't interested in the results, aren't interested in the thinking, aren't interested in anything. So for those people, they've come halfway. They've said, you know what, look at the results something's going right. I don't like what she thinks, but I do like this. So let me take this, but I just won't take the thoughts. But my point is that we've only got the results because of the way that I think. Right? So you can't have one without the other. You've got to. And so if you've come that far, what I always ask people to do is try and go a step further. The thing to, re to know about me is that you know, when I first started teaching, I was trained in a normal teacher training place. Uh, I thought in a very progressive way. I was teaching French through rap. And um, I, I, I was doing all the kind of normal stuff that progressives do. And it was over years that I came to realize, wait a minute, actually, if I get them to memorize these French verbs, actually, that works quite well. <laughs> and um. <laughs> I just, I, at first I had desks in groups and then I moved them to rows. And I thought, well, actually the kids facing me seems to work much better. So over years, I changed my practice to be more and more traditional. And I also learned from more traditional teachers. So the thing is in those days, uh, there, were, there were traditional teachers still around. Now, a lot of them have sadly either retired or they've, they've died. I mean, like Michaela herself. And um, so there's far fewer of them now to learn from. But in those days, I could learn from them. There was this PE teacher. His name was Mr. Phillips. He was so great with the kids. And I just used to watch him all the time. And he, all this stuff that I'm saying, explicit teaching, good discipline, traditional values, he embodied all of that. Now, he wouldn't be able to tell you that. You know, he wouldn't be able to stand up here and say, these are the things that I do, da dee da He just did it. Right? It was just what he did because he came from an era that where that was normal. So I learned from that. And gradually over years, I changed my mind. And so what I'm always saying to people is be willing to change your mind if you like the results. And that's why I was, I was saying to Manisha earlier, we need to get people into your school. We, people come and visit us at Michaela because people do argue with the results. Mm -hmm. People argue with the results because they say things like, well, they're obviously an exam factory and the kids are really miserable and they're all having mental health problems and so on. So that's what they say. But when they come to the school, it's very hard to argue with that because you've got very happy children. You see them playing basketball and ping pong and running around the yard. They take you around the school and they tell you how brilliant their school is and how happy they are there. It's very hard to argue with the children, you see. It's very hard, because they get it. They know, because they know what the alternative is, because they've been to other schools and they know what the difference is. So it's hard to argue with that, which is why we need as many schools like ours as possible and to get as many visitors in there as possible to persuade them. So, you know, this idea of being Britain's strictest headmistress, this is, this is, the, this is the badge and even the, a recent documentary, which, which I'll recommend to, to our yes. audience as well to, to check out. Mm. Uh, in an environment like this, surely students are, 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 are you, you must have trouble keeping students or even recruiting students what's the what's the reality well i mean the thing is in london there are always loads of kids so um when we first opened i had to go around canvassing and so on to be able to get people to apply but we did open with the uh, required 120 because we opened with one year group and six or seven teachers so uh we got that number and then we grew after that and of course um our reputation obviously has grown. So now there, there are lots of people who, who want to send their children. But um, yeah, so that, that hasn't been so much of an issue. Uh, but, but, but what I always say to my advice to other principals is you've got to know what you believe and you've got to stay strong with that. And even when you think, oh, that might mean that I don't get any kids or that might mean I don't get any teachers, you've got to just, you've got to believe and you've just got to hold the line with yourself and not pander to people. So I loved what you were saying about parents. I say to parents that I am the dragon lady. 
and that I'm not going anywhere and that if they want to send their child to my school, they need to deal with me. I say, think of us like a personal trainer. Parenting is hard and we are going to tell you that whatever it is you're doing right now is not good enough and you're going to have to get better. <laughs> um, and they laugh like that in a slightly more nervous manner, though. <laughs> and then I say, you think I'm joking. But I'm not joking. And if you want to send your child here, I say the day I send my child to your school, I'll do what you say. You send your child to my school and he's mine. That's what I say. <laughs> and, and I just, and that's what I did from the beginning, you know? And, but they still send, you know, and what always happens is at the end of the talk, you know, you would think, oh my goodness, all these parents are going to run away. But at the end of every, and I give so many of these talks, uh, at the end of the talk, Parents always come up to me and say, I love what you're doing. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Like they all, they're inspired by it. They like it. People like, you know, people pay money for a personal trainer, remember? You know, you want somebody when you're doing your push-ups to say, do another one, do another one. You don't want a personal trainer saying, it's all right, honey. I know it's really hard. Don't worry about the other push-up, right? <laughs> That's not what you want. You want somebody who's going to hold you to account. And that is what I do for our families. So well, on that then, so as far as the onboarding of parents, help us understand in, in Australia there is very much a mentality that between school hours you've just outsourced mm. your obligations as far as education goes and the school takes care of all of that. So how is it that you educate the parents as well and how do you, do you, do you, do you have to kind of give them permission to take a more authoritative role? Um, yeah. I mean, look, we tend to just move on and just keep doing what we're doing. Um, and the parents who we're dealing with most of all are the parents of children who are, who, who are difficult, you know? I have to say a lot of the parents we don't hear from much at all because they're happy with the school, the school's doing well, their child is doing well, and so they're just happy, and that's that. Uh, the ones who are more, you know, the children who are from more challenging backgrounds, those parents are in and out all the time, and we're constantly talking to them. I would say that every family at the school gets better, and when I say better, they're better at supporting their child with their homework, or they're better at making sure their child turns up on time. You know, I love this business of saying to them that, you know, they're late as opposed to the kids because you've got little ones. But I say to the families all the time, look, we, I'm, I promise you I'm going to give you an excellent education. You have got to do your job at home. You've got to get them here on time. You've got to get them here in the right uniform. You've got to get them here with their homework done. And if you don't do that, I'm going to pull you in and say you are not doing a good job as a parent because you can do the same to me. If I don't give you excellent teaching, then by all means meet with me and tell me that the teaching isn't very good. But that obviously never happens because we are, we are delivering. If we are going to deliver, the parents have to deliver. And I think it is too far gone in society now, in Western societies, where parents don't understand the role that they've got. Parents need to know that they have a responsibility. Fathers have a responsibility to turn up for their children. Everyone has, moms and dads have a responsibility to make sure that homework gets done. They have a responsibility to help teach their child at home. One of the things that I say on Twitter that people find very unpopular, which is that I say, even if, if you may not be homeschooling your child officially, but you should be homeschooling your child, you don't just send your child off to school and expect the school to do everything. You should be be doing some extra work at home. And I tell you, and my advice to parents is, you send your child off to a school and you just trust the school. What do you know about the school? What do you know about the teachers that are in there? I can tell you for nothing, I can tell you all this, all of you who are parents in here, I can give you this advice, which is that every single school out there has excellent teachers and terrible teachers. Every single one. And even the good schools. In fact, all the studies show that there is more in-house variation in one school between the excellent teacher and the terrible teacher than there is between schools, i.e., you, you think to yourself, but I've got him into a good school, so they're always going to have excellent teaching. That is not true. There are bad teachers in every single school. And you could send your child to the bad school and actually end up with a better experience than if you send them to the good school. That's just a fact, according to the studies. And I know this just anecdotally in terms of what I know. There, there are always excellent teachers everywhere, and there are always bad teachers everywhere. So this nonsense that parents think, I just send my kid to school and they'll be okay, that is mad. It's mad. Every parent should be supporting their children at home, buying those extra books from the bookshop with extra maths and extra English, making sure they're reading all the time. Because if you're not doing that, I'm telling you, your child is underachieving. That, I can tell you that for nothing. And the, the, unfortunately, 
we have this idea that you just send them off to school and they'll just be fine. And then it's because of our Western mindset. They don't think like this in the East, okay? So in the West, we think to ourselves, well, he never really took to maths. Just, he just didn't like it. And so never really did very well at maths because that's how he was born. Nobody thinks like that in the East. Nobody. Everyone in the East thinks, I'm going to make my child into the best possible mathematician ever that's ever existed. And then they work their child to death on, uh, in terms of the maths or in terms of the English or in terms of the French, whatever it is. They believe that what they do, that the environment that surrounds the child is going to make a difference to that child. Whereas in the West, we just think they're born that way and they're going to end up whichever which way, no matter what we do. It's not true. I tell you, depending on what school you send your child to, your child at 18 will be a different person, will actually be a different person depending on their school experience. And, and yet, we were talking about this yesterday, education is not a vote winner. And it's not a vote winner because people have no idea just how important it is. Important to a country's future, important to your own child's future. And um, we, we just, we, we, we're kind of sleepwalking you know, we're sleepwalking. We're like a bunch of wildebeests about to run off this cliff. And, and, and I'm standing at the edge of the cliff going, hello, Manisha's standing there going, hello, hello. And the wildebeest just going, going without thinking about it. We have got to pull back from the cliff. So progressive education, we're back in the classroom again. For parents in the room, even teachers in the room, mm -hmm. what is it that you're talking about? So you, you talked about where kids are placed, the actual structure of the room. Yeah. What, are, what else are the markers? What are the things that we should be wary of? Yeah. Well, you know, I was on um, Sky this morning, TV, and um, they were saying to me, well, what should parents do? What can they look for? And, uh, and I said, well, you know, when you go on a website, you want to look for the word tradition, for instance. They were talking a lot about back to basics. I was saying, do they talk about reading? Do they talk about maths? Do they talk about history and geography and so on? Or do they instead talk about cross-curricular projects? And do they talk about you know, all this kind of progressive stuff. And what was funny was that these Sky people, you know, the the uh, the journalist interviewing me, burst into laughter and said, but that's all the schools. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and I do feel for parents in that sense, because if it is all the schools, then that's hard. And then I take my advice even more seriously, which is that if all the schools are doing cross-curricular pro projects and have desks in groups and, uh, and have kids, like they think that interesting teaching is for all the kids to put post-it notes on their foreheads and to get up and wander around the classroom. I mean, it is absolutely ridiculous where nobody is learning anything. And the thing is, is that you all need to know this as parents because it, if they're not teaching your kids, that's not teaching them. So if you're not teaching them at home, your kids are not being taught. I mean, that, that's all I can say. If, if that's what's going on in the schools, the kids aren't learning anything. Um, and, and then what ends up happening is that the way in which a country survives is that they just have to import people who have been educated, right? So they have to have tons of immigration because those are the only people you can employ. I mean, they, and I know as an employer, I know this, you know, I employ people. And of course, you start looking and you think, oh, well, actually, this person who was brought up in Poland, their English is better than, than our own homegrown kids. There's something wrong with that, right? Now, and the thing is, is that people, all of you who employ people, you know what I'm talking about. That's the thing. You all know what I'm talking about, but nobody will say it. Nobody says it. So the few of us who do say it, they then brand me a lunatic because I'm the only one saying it. You all need to say it. You need to come out and tell the truth. That is what is required. <laughs> so we, we've got educators here today. We spoke to a few hundred educators yesterday, all who, who gave you a great reception. But how can we give them confidence that this movement really is one that can overcome that orthodoxy? Is there, what can you tell us about in the UK, that journey yeah. that, that, that for our educators here? Okay, so for those of you who are teachers in here, the thing is, is that it's hard to do it on your own, but it can be done. So in your own classroom, you have a, a, a system which is predictable. You know, you have a point system or a merit system. We use merits and demerits. You get a demerit, it's the first warning. Second demerit, detention. Third demerit, you stand outside the classroom. Now you might say, okay, I can't put them outside the classroom. Fine. Make sure you have detentions. Make sure you follow up with those detentions. Make sure you also give merits. 
Make sure you have a stamper that you can go around and stamp their work when they're doing well. Make sure you leave time at the end of the day so you can ring home to parents, not just for the bad stuff, but for the good stuff too. Because when you make the good call, then when you make the bad call later, they're more likely to believe you. Make sure that you do a quiz every week, every two weeks. You're doing a little mini quiz just to show the kids that they're learning something so they can feel really empowered. Make sure you're standing at the front of the classroom and telling them stuff. Don't feel bad about it. Don't have them guess. Don't play the game of guess what's in my head. You got to teach them stuff. Just tell them what they need to know. And then 10 minutes later, test to ask questions. See if they've got it. Then 10 minutes later, bring in some more information that you're telling them. You can ask them to fuse two pieces of knowledge. That's fine. But if you're not seeing the majority of hands up, then you've done something wrong. You haven't explained it properly. Reteach it so that they've got it. Now, once you're doing this and you've got your discipline and you've got the kids because you've got to get the buy-in of the kids, what people never understand about Michaela or, or about your school, what they do not understand uh, about the Marsden way, yes, what they don't understand is that you can, we, well, there's like 60 of us teachers and there are seven, 750 kids, right? There's no way that we could hold them all just by being bouncers and standing around going, we're going to give you detention. It's not detention that keeps kids in line. It's their buy-in. You have got to have the buy-in from all of the kids. And that includes the kids who are constantly getting detentions. They need to know that you are on their side and that you love them. And when they feel love, they, forget, they forgive you the detention. They know that the detention is to help them. They get that. So you need their buy-in. Once you've got the kids on side, you've got them working for you, you can then have other people come and visit you. So, the, I mean, Glenn was telling me about you, Manisha, and how you're similar to me, which is that we just plow on. We just do whatever we want. You know, I always say, whenever I'm making a decision about anything, I say, are they going to put me in prison? If they're not putting me in prison, then we're doing it. And I don't care, right? That's about everything. I, everything is putting me in prison. Okay, let's go. And the thing <laughs> is, it means I don't follow any of the orthodoxy. I don't follow any of the rules. I don't do anything that they tell me. When we were w w wanting, when we opened up at first, you know, we are a free school. Department of Education would send us uh, an, a current Ofsted inspector. So Ofsted is the inspection regime in Britain. Uh, they would send us a cur current Ofsted inspector and our link person at the Department for Education. And they'd come and visit us every few months. And not just us, every free school they did this for because the government wanted free schools to be able to secure a one or a two. There's a one, two, three, four way of judging schools accor in, uh, according to Ofsted. And they wanted to secure ones and twos for their free schools because Otherwise, the free school movement would, would be a disaster. So they'd send these people every few months to give advice. And these people would come and they would beg me to do certain things. They'd say, please, Catherine, write your self-evaluation plan. Please, Catherine, write your three-year plan of blah, blah, write this, write that. And I'd say, no, I'm not doing any of it. I'm not wasting my time doing any of that nonsense. I've got a school to run. And, um, and they would beg me. I mean, this woman from the DFE, she said, you don't understand, Catherine. Every time we leave your school, we stand outside for ages talking, saying, she could get anywhere from a one to a four. And I'd always say, there's something wrong with the system if I could get anywhere from a one to a four. I mean, what is this inspectorate? In any case, I refused to do what they said um, and I just plowed on. And in the end, the inspectors came. Now they gave us a one. It's true, they could have given us a four. What they were saying was absolutely true, but I was willing to take that risk. You as teachers in your own classrooms, you need to think the same way. Do what is right. Do what the kids want you to do because you're in this game to change their lives. That's why you're there. You're not there to tick some boxes, to be some bureaucrat. You, you are there to change these kids' lives. So you just got to plow on. And then in the end, what happens, as Glenn was telling me, Manisha, about your school, is that people come to see. They look and they go, how did you do this? How has this happened? You know, I have a friend... 20, 25 years I've been friends with him. He works at one of the local schools as an assistant head. He came to visit us. He went round talking to the kids, seeing all the classrooms. At some point he came bursting into my office and he said, Catherine, I've been talking to all the kids and they've all been to the same primary schools as our kids. 
what have you done to them? Because <laughs> I mean, he couldn't believe that these were the same kids that he has at his school. And then that's what happens is that eventually they come, you know, and they keep coming and they look and they say, oh, I see. The same thing's going to happen in your schools. Your classroom will become a kind of oasis. And then other teachers are going to come and then they're going to copy and they're going to learn from you. So you've just, you've got to find that kind of resolve to be able to do it to close your door. Often teachers will say things, yeah, but they, they're going to, I'm going to get into trouble. They're going to tell me off. But if you think about it, how often do they actually observe you? I mean, most, most of the time, the senior leaders aren't coming into your classrooms. The senior leaders aren't doing any of the things they say they're going to do. So it's the same with the whole system. They threaten you with all sorts of things, but they never actually follow through with any of it. So just close your door and get on with what works. That's what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll come to your questions in the audience in just a few minutes, but uh, I'd like to draw you on a policy-relevant question that, that's timely for us here in New South Wales. Uh, recently, our Premier, uh, Dominic Perrottet, uh, indicated he'd like to see a school's behavioural advisor here in schools in New South Wales. Yeah. Now, this is effectively replicating a process that the UK went through some years ago in yep. appointing a recent CIS guest, Tom Bennett. Mm -hmm. Is this a positive development? Yeah, great. Really good. I mean, Tom Bennett has been brilliant for Britain. I mean, um, because it, the, he's brilliant, but it's also just the case. Having a behavior czar makes everyone realize how important behavior is. And it's then someone who's out there in the press constantly talking about behavior and how to get good behavior. Uh, but I would say that whoever then takes on that role needs to think on two levels because it isn't just about the teacher in their classroom and the behavior techniques that they need to use in order to get good behavior. It is partly about that. And, and the behavior techniques aren't just about giving detention. It's about the stampers. It's about the love. It's about the relationships you have with those kids so that they'll work hard for you. Behavior is complex. It doesn't just happen because you throw out a detention. Um, but but there's behavior in by, by the teacher, but there's also behavior by the leaders in the school. And that is often something that is forgotten and that leaders in schools do not understand that their role, my role, is to enable my teachers to teach. And leaders too often are undermining their, their staff by not understanding that they have to find systems of centralization, you know, so one of, the, one of the things, as an example, when I said we have merits and demerits and the way that it works, that happens in every single classroom. And that consistency supports all of my teachers, including my weakest teachers. It means that if you go around my school, you can't tell the difference between the teachers who've been doing this for 10 years and the ones who have just arrived for a few weeks. You genuinely, you can't tell. You'll go around. Now, if you're a real expert, you might notice. But if you're not an expert, you just go around and you think it's all the same. And the reason why it seems all the same is because of the consistency that my senior team and I are establishing from the top. And then that means that we're like a, we're like a machine, you know, the, the whole school moves forward as opposed to each individual teacher trying to exist and survive on their own. So my advice obviously to teachers here is you're trying to do it on your own and you need to do that and that's fine. But the most powerful situation is when the principal at the top believes it and then understands that it is their responsibility to empower their teachers by bringing all the teachers together to do the same thing. Before we go to, to the audience, I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to reflect upon uh, your capacity in another hat, the other hat that you wear, which uh, is as the chair of the UK's Social Mobility Commission. Yeah. Now, it seems no coincidence to me that, that an educator should take that role. Mm. Uh, tell, can you tell us a little bit about the, the commission and why you think you've been, uh, why, you've, why, why you're the right person to lead that? Yeah, well, uh, there are two big things that enable a social mobility for a child, school and their family. Those, those two things are, are, are massive. Um, and uh, I obviously have experience in dealing with both. Um, and so it's something that we're trying to highlight through the commission, uh, looking at what good schools do uh, in, in order to achieve excellent results um, and, and looking at what families do because what we often say is 
poor children do badly, rich ch children do well. What we need to do is just make everybody rich. And that's just not true, right? There are lots of poor families that do really well with their kids. And that's because uh, all poor families are not the same, just like all rich families are not the same. And there are certain things that families are doing, the more successful families are doing. There are certain things that they're doing and we need to highlight what those things are. Things like um, when your child is very small, talking to them all of the time. Um, <coughs> Reading to them, 20 minutes of reading every day. That's something that all families should be doing. A lot of families just don't know that that's what they're meant to do because in their community, it's not done. So how are you meant to know? I mean, if you think about it, it's a bit of an odd thing talking to a toddler because toddlers don't respond. And you say things like, oh, hello, how are you today? It's so lovely to see you. Oh, you know, where have you been? I bet you've been to the park. Did you go to the park? Well, I went to the park too and I thought it was really lovely and sunny. Did you like it too? I bet you found it really hot. Like that's a weird conversation. If you think about it, you're answering for the child. Now, any normal person doesn't do that. They just think, well, I'll talk to them when they can talk. Like what, right? Like that's how you would think. And how are you meant to know that you're meant to do that? Because if you're not talking to them in that way, the child is not going to develop their literacy. And then by the time they then get to school, it's for us to then be trying to catch them up. Now, of course, we ought to do that in school, but it is also the case that if we could spread the word amongst families about what they need to be doing, much more of that would happen. And it's not because they're poor that they don't do it, because there are poor families that do this. It's because they don't know. And it's also because politicians never talk about families. Politicians never talk, they never highlight the issue around families because uh, no politician would dare be, want to be seen to be critical of families because families are the ones who vote them in. And it's not that I'm being critical of them. I'm saying that we need to address those issues. So families and schools, we're also looking at routes into work. Um, you know, it's interesting because my uh, deputy chair, uh, a man called Alan Francis, he's uh, the principal of an FE college in Oldham up in the north of England, uh, serving... Uh, you know, a very deprived um, uh, group of kids up there. Um, and he, of course, he and I just, every time we say anything, it's like you and she talks and I think, well, I could just, I could hear myself talking, you know? And the thing that I realize is that those of us on the ground who, um, who, who work with deprived communities, we get it. We, we get it because we're working with deprived children and we've been doing it all our lives. So we see what works and what doesn't work. And the people who are arguing against us don't have a clue. They tend to be the media classes, never works in teaching. They don't know anything. Um, and they're, they're trying to stop us from doing what works with these kids. So, um, yeah, that, that is what I find. And um, those of us who are honest enough to look at um, the real situation and what really works um, and to be brave enough, because that's the thing, it takes a lot of bravery, uh, to be able, just to, bravery in your own classroom, to say, you know what, I've been doing it this way for a while, let me try and do it differently and see whether or not it can work. Um, that, that, that takes a lot. I remember I once met a, a, a man, a principal of a primary school. He was in his 50s and um, for all his life, he'd never done phonics uh, for reading to teach the little ones. And, um, and then he was telling me about how in his later years, he discovered phonics and realized what a game changer it was and how he now had phonics happening in his school. And he couldn't believe how, how well reading happened and how all of the kids were reading. Um, and that for his whole career, uh, you know, that had never been the case. And the thing I was so interested in talking to him about, I said, but how did you, at your age, make that change, you know? And he, he'd taken some time off, he'd done an MA. He said the research was just impossible to reject. And so in the end, he changed his mind. But I think he was being very humble, you know, to, to, to especially later on in life like that, to be able to be humble enough to say, I've spent my life letting children down and I'm now going to change it so that I can fix that and let and make it so future children succeed who are in my care to be able to be honest enough with yourself you're, it's deep right it's deep to be able to think i've spent years letting children down 
Um, and it's what all of us have to do, you know? All of us have to be able to do that as teachers. And that's a hard thing to ask of someone, but it is essentially what we're asking people to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we are gonna open to the floor for questions, uh, just over here on the right. Um, Catherine, really enjoy hearing you say on previous, whether it's on, uh, in the media or on podcasts, talk about the importance of singing the national anthem to oh, your yeah. kids mm -hmm. and singing English hymns. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about why you think that's important for yeah. um, kids in the current environment, particularly with very strong political movements on progressive sides that seek to yeah. undermine that, um, how much, how important that is? Yeah, 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 it's a good question. So, yeah, we sing now God Save the King um, and uh, we sing I Vow to Thee My Country and Jerusalem. These are all, you know, s hymns to celebrate our country. And um, the reason we do that is I think it's really important for all our children to feel like they belong. And unfortunately, identity politics these days uh, encourages children. It, it divides the country and it makes kids feel. I mean, how are you meant to grow up in a country and m contribute if you feel like your country is against you? Like, it, 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 like that, you're already on the back foot. You're already thinking, well, I'm not going to get the job because I'm brown or I'm black. I'm not going to get the job because I'm in the wrong religion. You know, you, you can't think like that. You need to think that you belong to your country. And our children feel that they are British. And they feel they're British because we talk about being British. We sing the national anthem. We, uh, we I mean, I haven't talked about the king yet, but in the day I would talk about the queen all the time. And, um, and... You know, we would s celebrate her birthday, for instance. We, 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 and we do this. Oh, well, how do you do that? You know, we'd have some red and white and blue bunting and stuff up and all that kind of thing. And, and it would be the queen's birthday. And that was it. But it was very much, um, we are part of our country. Children need to feel part of something. They need to feel part of their family. They need to feel part of their community, part of their school and part of their country. And if they don't feel like that, they will find belonging elsewhere, in a gang, in a social media group where they might get radicalized. They will find, because it's human nature, we all want to belong. Why was I saying that it's great that CIS is here bringing us all together? Because you feel like you belong. You come somewhere where you feel there are like-minded people and you belong with these people. And those, when people feel like they're on their own, it, it's not. It, it's a horrible feeling, and it's such a horrible feeling that people will will not talk, will not tell the truth, will not say what they actually think, just so they can be part of a group. That's how much we are as as animals. We need our group identity, and if we don't give them a group identity of belonging to their country, they will find their group identity somewhere else, and that is not helpful for the country because we've all got to find a way to get on. You know, we it, it's it's very difficult making a, a, a multicultural cultural, uh, multi-faith uh, community work. You know, that's our community at, at Michaela. But it works precisely because it's all done under the umbrella of Britain and that we are all British. And if we don't have that in common, then we have nothing, right? And, and then it's just each man for himself. And that is a disaster for any country. So that's why I think it's so important that we should sing the national anthem and that all of our children should be British. And I think by not doing that, the children who suffer the most are the ethnic minorities because everybody is always telling them that they're not really Australian or not really British and that their country is against them. And how can they possibly succeed with that? Thank you. Thank you. Um, initial teacher training seems to be a big part of the problem. So my question is, what needs to change with that? And what would your advice be to someone thinking about becoming a teacher and is therefore facing the prospect of three years of teacher education at a university? Yeah, that is a very good question. We were talking about that yesterday, weren't we, with one of your colleagues who's doing that. Um, yeah. The thing is, like Michael Gove in, in Britain, he took on all kinds of people. He couldn't take on the teacher training institutions. It was impossible. He couldn't win that. Um, and I, I, I don't see how that can be done. Uh, you just need to go and do your teacher training and then just unlearn everything they teach you. <laughs> it's like, that's all I can suggest. You know, at Michaela, when we hire teachers, we bring them in and we reteach them on how to teach. In fact, I find it easier with graduates straight from university 
because they haven't been trained in the wrong way. Whereas people who have been teacher trained, I have to undo all of the damage that they that they've done, you know. And there's sort of an, uh, yeah, you just have to. I often hear from PGCs, so our, our teacher trainer uh, system in 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 England. I often hear from them where they write to me and say, "Oh, I'm trying to stand up and I'm trying to say what's right and so on." And I always say, "Keep your head down. Don't say a word. Just agree with what they think." quietly just get on with it and then when you're in your own classroom you can do what you want you know and and just get on twitter uh you know learn from the traditional pedagogues on there uh read the books that you know glenn will tell you everything that you need to read um, <laughs> and uh and and keep that in the back of your head so every time you're doing anything that they're telling you to do you do it as a kind of performance. That's how all of us used to be. I mean, things are much better in England now than they used to be. So in 2000, 2005 and so on, um, people like Michaela, the woman, you know, or I, what we would do is that you knew if somebody was coming in to observe you, you would put on a lesson that you would never normally teach. You would pretend that you were a progressive and then they'd go away and tick the boxes and then you'd get on and do whatever you do normally. That, that, that's, that's how you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested to know what you think about how the internet's impacted education. Does it have a part at Michaela? Yeah. Uh, yeah, good question. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think it's hugely uh, problematic for children and what you just said. You know, what you all need to know is that in 2010, when the iPad came out and the, a journalist talked to Steve Jobs about it and said, what do your kids think of the iPad? He said, obviously, my kids don't have the iPad. Why would I give the iPad to my kids? That was his reaction. Bill Gates did not give his children data until 16. All of those big tech CEOs keep their children protected from this stuff. Meanwhile, they are making their money and flying around in private jets off of our ignorance. That's what people don't understand. They do not give their children smartphones. They do not give them unlimited and unsupervised access to the internet. They don't. Now, and so I do huge things with my families, you know, lots of, uh, you know, uh, advice that I give them about not giving the child a smartphone, not allowing them unsupervised access to the internet. Um, you know, what people don't realize, there are mums out there. I mean, I, I could tell you very diff various different stories of children who have been murdered, who had unsupervised access to the internet. Their children get murdered. The mums are then campaigning, trying to get information out there to tell people about it, but nobody's listening. And they don't listen because it's a great babysitter. It is very easy to hand a child a phone or a computer and then just let them to it, you know? Uh, much harder to get them reading, much harder to get them playing chess and so on. You've got to spend time with them to do that. Whereas you hand them the phone, you just leave them to it. And so families, this is what I say, it's not just about what we do in schools, it's about what families are doing. Um, now, partly it's because they don't know. I would suggest you all watch the film, uh, The Social Dilemma. Uh, it's essentially whistleblowers coming out from California saying, oh my goodness, what have we done, right? And they're not even talking about kids. They're talking about adults um, and how nobody reads anymore. Nobody can think, you know, it kills their brains. They're not able to follow a narrative that does this. Uh, I, I, we're, we're actually at the point where I'm asking the kids to watch Coronation Street and, you know, uh, various soap operas because they follow the narrative as opposed to being on Snapchat and seeing 20 second videos of somebody laughing at somebody else and then that's the end of it. Let's take one over here. Thank you. Thanks. As Glenn's observed, we've seen a real collapse in student writing in Australia. How do you teach writing in Michaela? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the big things that we push is reading. Reading is the number one thing that's going to get kids to write well. And, of course, if they're on their phones, then they're not reading. Uh, and it, it really starts at primary school getting them reading. So we are constantly having reading challenges. So at the moment over the half term while I'm over here, the kids have got this challenge. They've got to read two books and they've got to write these book reviews. And there's this whole competition happening through the school. Um, later on this year, we're doing a trip to the Waterstones bookshop and certain kids will be able to go. We have a library where we pack it full with all kinds of books that we think that they would enjoy reading. And we're constantly talking about the library, constantly talk, talking about reading. I mean, there are... Um, Systems for writing that you can use, like Engelman's, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, 
uh, yeah, direct instruction, exactly. But um, the the for 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 writing, you can use his his like when I say you, schools can use his program, and we have used his program to teach writing. Uh, which is very good. You can use it lower down in primary school, but you could even use it in the earlier years of secondary for certain kids. But the number, the number one thing really is reading. The problem now is that you see kids on the subway or in the restaurants and they're two years old, three years old, and their parents have given them an iPad or a phone to keep them busy. And I mean, I always hold myself back, but I always, every time I see this, I want to go up to the mother and say, do you realize what you're doing? <laughs> Your child is never going to learn how to read. And the reason they're never going to learn how to read or like reading is because a book cannot compete with a phone. A phone has colors and pop-ups and explosions and all sorts. A, a, a book is black and white and it's flat. And it requires real engagement of the brain to be able to read, to read and imagine and, and follow the narrative. And it, it requires brain activity. <clears throat> Phones don't require brain, brain activity, which is why we're, we're all like dummies just looking at them. It's so easy because you don't have to really think. Um, and <clears throat> when you're doing it at our age, it's bad enough. But when you're doing it, when your brain is growing, it's actually stunting the growth of your brain. It's stunting your ability to be able to read. And you then don't take to reading. And like I said, our Western way of thinking is to say, he just never liked reading, just never took to it really. I don't know why, it's just the way that he was. And actually it's because you gave him that phone. So, um, it, you know, a campaign, a national campaign against this, the, the, the internet, would, would do a huge amount for your writing, you know, as, as, a, as a country and, and promoting reading. You know, when I said, what are the key things you need to do with a toddler? Talk to them, talk to them, play to them, write to them, read to them. You know, those, those are the three things you need to do. Um, and that reading, 20 minutes a day, every day, you know, throughout, not just when they're little, like all the way up, you know, until eventually then they're, they're able to do it on their own. And then they enjoy uh, the book and they 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 will then just do it without thinking because they really they get into the book you know um my assembly last week for the school for all my so i do seven assemblies every week it was all about reading and um and we'd done this reading survey with the year sevens and eights and i took all of their comments and i was reading out their comments to all of the kids right up to the sixth form and it was interesting because the sixth formers who are you know 17 uh, I said, look, I think we all need to learn from these 11 year olds. Listen to the things that they're saying about, about reading. And so I read out all these comments and it was fascinating because after I gave the assembly, the sixth form library was buzzing and everybody was in there getting out books. So it's, it's about talking about that, but nationally you all need to be talking about the importance of reading and your writing will then come. And just a final one at the back here. Thank you very much. Um, Britain in 2014 introduced a policy of sort of teaching traditional British values. Yes. Um, and yet in London at the minute, hate crime is, is up um, significantly. What lessons can Australia learn um, about teaching traditional values given that conservative attempts to teach British values perhaps have not succeeded? Yeah, well, that's because nobody knew what British values were. <laughs> I mean, we, I, I remember at the time people were like, well, what, did, what are British values? What does that mean? Um, and it, it was hilarious because nobody told anybody what British values were. People would sort of say things like democracy. We believe in democracy. And then the schools went around saying we, we love democracy. And that isn't, see, British values was the wrong word. What they should have said was I call them small c conservative values. You can call them traditional values. These are not party political. There are many big C conservatives who are not small C conservatives. Um, and there are many people of the left. My father is a man of the left. He's very much a small C conservative. And what do we mean by small C conservative values? I referred to them earlier. Things like believing in personal responsibility, believing that, um, what does that mean? I haven't done my homework. I'm responsible for that. I'm not going to make an excuse for myself. I'm not going to see myself as a victim. I'm going to take responsibility for myself. Um, we, for instance, the, one of our big poems that we recite all the time at school is Invictus by William E. Henley. And at the end, uh, the two lines are, 
I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And that idea that I am the master of my fate, I can make that difference. I am responsible for who I become. Um, so there's that. Then there's the belief in duty towards others, you know, uh, that when you misbehave in your class, we would never just narrate it as, well, that's a demerit and it's just your thing. We would say, you have a demerit, but you are letting everybody else in the team down. We talk about your team and you are letting everybody down by misbehaving because everybody else's learning has been delayed because of you. And that is always narrated, this idea that you don't just have a duty to yourself, you have a duty to your parents, you have a duty to other people in your class and in your school and in the country. Um, we will talk about gratitude, the idea of being grateful for what you have, as opposed to always envying what somebody else has has who has more than you because somebody will always have more than you but somebody will also always have less than you and you must always think how lucky am I to have what I've got um and, and to be grateful for it. Uh, and so those are just some of the values that we would teach. I mean, there are others like sacrifice and service and, and, and honesty and so on. The, those kinds of traditional values have essentially disappeared to the point where when they said British values, nobody knew what they were. Nobody knew what to say. Um, and that's because <clears throat> the new... Um, the new uh, kind of religion in our schools has to do with uh, a very woke agenda is what I would call it, um, where it's about identity politics. It's about canceling people when they don't say the right thing. It is, it is, is highly religious, highly uh, uh, intolerant, and uh, has, has it, 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 what it has done is it's pushed out all of those traditional values, which are the values that help any of us succeed. You go go to any bookshop and look at the self-help books. All of those self-help books will be talking about the things that I've just said, all of them. They'll all say something like, write down at the end of the day how you're grateful for something so you'll be a happier person. They'll all say, about, like, small c conservative values are what make us happy and what make us successful. And yet they have all but disappeared from our schools. So um, that is, it, it was a sad thing in Britain, but that's, that is just a sign of our modern culture. And that's why I say it's for all of us to be talking about this stuff because, uh, you know, we, we can't do it on our own. We can do it in our own schools on our own. Uh, when, teachers, when teachers join my school, I don't just teach them how to teach. I teach them how to have those values, right? How to, how to value those values how to understand that those values matter when you teach. It's referring to your point about when people say they don't like the way that I think. Mm -hmm. If you don't think in this way, then you'll never be able to get your children to be successful because it's human nature to want to grab onto victimhood, to say it's not my fault, right? And what I always say, it might not be your fault, but it is your responsibility. Um, and if you don't take that responsibility and if you don't learn how to negotiate your way through life while keeping on to that sense of personal responsibility, um, you will never succeed. You just won't because you'll be blaming everybody else. You'll never be looking inward. Um, and you will not... You, 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 you will never feel real satisfaction. That's, that's the thing about all those values is it gives meaning to your life, right? And, uh, and that's what I say about my school and what I'm so thrilled about. My children have meaning. They have depth to them. They live a three-dimensional life, you know? They, they're not just cardboard cutouts going through the motions. They're real people. And that comes from the values. And the values are so important um, and so hard to, to pinpoint nowadays, I think, in our modern culture, which is why everybody in this room, <laughs> it requires all of us to shout about them as much as we can. As everyone, please thank Catherine Verbal Singh. Thank you. And before we go tonight or this afternoon, I'd, I'd like to also invite uh, some final comments from uh, from a, 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 another guest here that's returning to CIS for the first time in 2022, but was we had the pleasure of welcoming twice last year. And it's uh, Mr. Alan Tudge, who is the Shadow Minister for Education uh, federally, and until recently was the Minister for Education and Youth. Alan. Well, well, thank you very much. And I have the great pleasure of just um, casting a formal vote of thanks to you, 
Catherine. And before doing so, though, can I just acknowledge the CIS for putting this on today to your leadership, Glenn. Um, when you sort of said we've got to take education seriously, CIS for decades has taken education seriously. And I thank all the people in this room for coming along, supporting the CIS. They've had a massive impact on public policy in this country, um, particularly on reading from a former a CIS person, Jennifer Buckingham, and now through Glenn, all the work which he's doing and bringing you along and, and the like, and I certainly catch up with Glenn very frequently to get further ideas. I'm really, um, was really comforted by your address. I mean, you're an absolute powerhouse, but the three things that you talked about, the traditional values, the traditional teaching, the traditional discipline, how it is taught, I was largely talking about the school curriculum. At the time, we had a catastrophic draft national school curriculum, which, believe it or not, included in grade two teaching kids to identify statues which are racist. Right. We don't know who the statue is about, what the history is, but apparently a grade two can identify that, as well as almost a hatred of the country. So I was determined to have an impact on that. That's the what is, what is taught the values, um, the manner in which it is taught, traditional teaching. Every piece of research, as you said, says that explicit teaching is required. And that's not being done in this country, as I know it has not been done in the West more generally. My determination was to take on the main culprits who are responsible for this, and that is the teacher education faculties. Yeah. Good so you. you said no one would take this on. I was absolutely determined. In fact, I threatened in this room, virtually, $760 million of annual funding to be linked to evidence-based practice being taught. Oh, wow. Because for 20 years the evidence has been clear that if you don't have explicit teaching, kids aren't going to do as well. And the research is very clear on that. That relates to reading as well, of course. As I said, CIS has been the leader, I think, in the country in getting phonics back on the agenda. Mm. But we've had national reading inquiries in Australia, in the US um, and in the UK going back 10, 20 years, all of which have said phonics is essential and yet some teacher education faculties still don't teach it. Yes. And it is an absolute disgrace. It is. <laughs> and the people who miss out, of course, are the most disadvantaged people. Yes. Finally, the discipline, the environment in which it is taught, and that's really been the theme of what you've been discussing so far today. You're right. You, you documented this in, in your op-ed the other day. I used exactly the same stat um, at the CIS a year ago. We've gone from being the middle of the pack in terms of classroom environment to ranked now 70th out of 77. 43% of kids age 15 say so there's noise and disorder in nearly every single classroom. 40% mm. of kids now say that kids don't listen to the teachers. Yeah. Up by 20 percentage points from 20 years ago. And if you've got, as you know better than anyone than in this room, <laughs> that if you've got disruptive classroom environments, how the hell do you, do you, uh, uh, how the hell do you learn? I've certainly learned a lot today. It's given me a great deal of comfort. And um, I think we've all enjoyed your presentation and we you. say all strength to your arm. Thank you. For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. Mm -hmm.